Hello and welcome back everyone. I'm Adam Okada and I don't know about you, but today is absolutely flown by. What an incredible way to get into our weekend. So we've heard from some dynamic speakers today and saved a great topic for last. I'm excited to welcome to the virtual stage some exceptional industry in educators. First, I would like to introduce my colleague at Beyond Clean, Lisa McCown. She is a manager of research and development for Beyond Clean, and she also serves as a sterile processing education and quality coordinator for the Indianapolis suburban region of IU Health Network. As a healthcare professional, Lisa is driven to influence positive change for patient safety initiatives, and she is a, and is a catalyst for the advancement of infection prevention within sterile processing. Her passion is to educate and energize professional development. Teaming up with Lisa for this session, I would like to welcome back Dr. Michelle Alpha. If you missed our earlier introduction, Dr. Michelle Alpha, sponsored by 3M, is a consultant at AlphaMed Consulting Limited. She's a board certified clinical microbiologist and has her PhD in medical microbiology. Over the past 28 years, Dr. Alpha's research has been dedicated to hospital acquired infections, specifically related to monitoring disinfection and cleaning in the healthcare environment to reduce the risk of infection transmission. She's a well-known industry author, having published over 150 articles of study and research. Dr. Alpha has received many awards throughout her career, including the Champion of Infection Prevention and Control from IPAC. And you know me as your host for today's conference, but I would like to formally introduce myself to you all. My name is Adam Okada, and I have 15 years of experience in sterile processing, including about nine as a frontline technician. I am passionate about helping improve the quality of patient care by giving SPD technicians greater access to education and information. I'm also the owner of Sterile Education, the world's first mobile application dedicated to sterile processing education, a voting member of AMI, and I'm also the current president for the Central California chapter of ISHM. And now I'm honored to be a member of the Beyond Clean team. So join us as we have an all hands on deck discussion about the real life hand hygiene challenges sterile processing departments are experiencing today. We discuss many topics related to hand hygiene, including the use of gloves on the clean side, hand washing best practices, and the biggest secret bacteria carrier of all, our personal electronic devices. So it's time to wash our hands of these microbes and please join me in welcoming Lisa and Dr. Michelle Alpha. Hi, everyone. Hi, welcome in, everybody. Hi. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right into probably one of the most, um, I would say, controversial topics of today's discussion, and that's going to be the use of gloves on the clean side of SPD. I know a lot of differing opinions, and some of them are very strong uh, from sterile processing professionals about the use of gloves on the clean side. Um, so, Lisa, if you want to go ahead and take this question first. Uh, gloves on the clean side, where do you stand? Okay, so first I'd like to acknowledge that there are pros and cons to um, both sides. And um, when you're thinking about uh, the ability of the, of the technician to um, handle the device and carefully inspect it for uh, damages and so forth, Having the um, tactile uh, dexterity um, to feel the instrument is one of those things that you just really appreciate um, about handling instruments. And so it's understandable how, you know, when we're working with the devices, we want to be able to be um, glove free. On the other hand, there are, there are significant concerns um, considering what's on, on our hands. So... For example, uh, colonized microorganisms, oils, uh, soil residues, um, particulate matter such as lint, the shopping of our skin and hair, um, and also non-living substances uh, that pose potential infection risks such as um, endotoxins that we might have picked up from uh, wet instruments, um, prions, and uh, you know, pryogenic substances that can cause fever producing inflammation and things of that nature. So when we consider the risks, it's the other thing to bring to the conversation that I would love to have dialogue with the three, three of us together. And if anyone in the audience wants to contribute to this, um, we need to remember that glove wearing alone is not necessarily 
hand hygiene. So it's not only that we had to perform hand hygiene before we wear gloves, but whatever we touch with our gloves, we could be contaminating the gloves and making it completely pointless of having them on. So let's talk about that. Okay, and that's a great uh, segue into bringing Dr. Alpha into the conversation. Uh, so, Dr. Alpha, <laughs> uh, the use of gloves as a replacement for hand hygiene. Well, you know, I, 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 a couple of things. I'll start off with. Um, I totally agree that sometimes people wearing gloves, it's a panacea, and they forget that if you touch your face or you, you know, you touch. Um, you go to the washroom with your gloves on, God forbid. But the whole point is exactly what Lisa was saying, that your your gloves can be contaminated just as readily as your bare hands. And the point is that sometimes people um, feel that wearing gloves means that they are protected. And they also feel that, um, you know, I'm handling things and I'm touching them and I'm not exposing them to my bare skin, but they sometimes forget the fact that if you contaminate your gloves, uh, you certainly then can contaminate anything else that you touch. And there is a tendency that rather than taking off and putting on a new pair of gloves in between, you know, um, I guess, uh, processes that you probably should do that. Sometimes people will just leave their gloves on and do a whole variety of things. Um, in the research lab, we have the same problem. I'll give you the analogy that um, they may be using radioactive tracers and they use their gloves when they're doing their experimental stuff. And then when they go, they want to take they want to take their, their stuff down to another level to show it to somebody. They'll go and use the elevator and press the button. And there's been documentation of radioactive material on the buttons because they didn't change their gloves. They didn't change, do their hand hygiene and put on new gloves or at least have their hands which are not exposed to the radioactivity that's a, that's a gross example but it, it shows the point that sometimes people put gloves on and then they think everything is fine and they do a multitude of activities without taking them off or changing them because they they just it just doesn't come to their consciousness so i i think the that that concept of um should you wear gloves on the clean side or not? Um, Lisa has already alluded to the fact that the tactile component is important, but she's also alluded to the fact that if you haven't done your hand hygiene properly, you can be exposing them to microorganisms that you don't want actually getting on the instruments. In terms of the guidelines, I think pretty much most of them, I know for sure the CSA um, document does talk about the fact that if instruments go through a washer disinfector and they're basically exposed to 90 degree temperatures, the thermal decontamination component of that is thought to be enough to make those instruments safe to handle without wearing gloves. So we wear gloves on the um, reprocessing side or the um, the cleaning side because those instruments um, have organic material. They could have viruses, bacteria, et cetera. And to protect the reprocessing staff, absolutely you wear gloves on that side and nobody would ever think differently. On the clean side, if the instruments have gone through a washer disinfector and they've been thermally decontaminated, then I think the, the, the dogma has always been that it makes it safe to handle. So in the clean side, you're, it's, it's okay for you to handle them with your hands. One exception to that, and I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna throw this question back to, to Lisa and to yourself, Adam, is, you know, there are electronic devices, hand to drills, et cetera, et cetera, that do not go through the washer disinfectors or very fragile instruments that do not go through the washer disinfectors. And they are, they're cleaned manually and then they're just transferred to the clean side. It's those ones that I worry about the most because they are not thermally decontaminated and they are no different than they were on the reprocessing <laughs> side. Uh, they have the potential to carry microbes, which you cannot see, so they might look clean but they still could have microbes there that you then are going to get on your hands um, or on your gloves. And I think that's the one subset of um, instrumentation that I think poses the biggest risk for this particular question. And so, you know, it'd be interesting to hear your comments on it because I do think that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest with you, 
I'm on the kind of on the fence in terms of if it's gone through a washer disinfector, you know, they are thermally decontaminated. I get we want those instruments to be, you know, properly assessed by the staff before they get a packed and you know, prep and pack and go to sterilization. We want to make sure that they're functioning properly, et cetera. Um, I am cognizant of the idea though that bare hands do have oils. They could have if you haven't done hand hygiene properly, they could have microbes that that get on to those instruments. I think in the overall scheme of things, though, the key component is um, we want to make sure the staff are able to do their job properly. And I think that's why the guidelines have kind of remained the way they have, where they say that if it's gone through thermal decontamination, it's safe to handle without gloves. The exception to that, though, I absolutely think gloves should be worn when you're handling devices that have not had thermal decontamination, and they're now in the clean side. And I think staff need to be aware of the fact that, remember, the table you're putting them on or whatever, however you're handling them, your hands are going to get contaminated if you're handling them without gloves. So it's, I think, I personally would recommend that the gloves should be worn in that scenario because that's quite a different scenario. And that when you're finished with those, those gloves taken off, removed. And if you're going to be continuing to work and put gloves on, you need hand hygiene, obviously, when you take your gloves, change your gloves. Um, so that is my bias in terms of where gloves should be used and where they shouldn't be used. Um, when they come through SPD. And remind me to comment on um, after full reprocessing for endoscopes, because I don't want us to forget that one as well. <laughs> but I'll, I'll leave it Absolutely. there. Those are my, my thoughts on the guidelines and, you know, what I think about them. Yeah, and there, you know what, when we talk about gloves in the clean side, it opens up a lot of cans of worms, right? There's a lot of exceptions to the rule. There's a lot of things that don't really apply. Uh, there's a lot of instructions for use that don't have disinfection. So I think when the important thing to t when we're talking about this issue is you have decontamination, which is essentially you're removing visible and non-visible soil. You're physically removing it with either with enzymatics that make it easier to get that soil off or detergents that make it easier to get that soil off, but it's the removal of soil. Those microorganisms, those microbes are still there. Uh, they're still present on the device after that. It's not killing those microbes and it's not removing them. You're removing the gross soil. So that's what that disinfection step does. When you're going through a thermal, an automated washer, that's thermal disinfection. That's killing whatever is left, the microorganisms that are left. Now, when you skip that step and you go to a hand wash, let's say, you do an enzymatic soak, you do a wipe down, um, and then you pass it through the pass-through window because that's what the IFU say to do, there's no disinfection step. There's nothing killing the microbes that are still left on that device. And so, um, you know, I, I know there's techs out there and I've, I've worked with a lot of them that uh, when they see something come through from the dirty side, whether it's gone through the washer or not, they don't trust the decontamination techs. So they say, well, I wear gloves to protect myself because I don't trust that the decontamination is being done properly. Uh, but again, like you guys mentioned, you know, that can cause some issues as well if you're not treating those gloves and not removing them, doing proper hand hygiene and then coming back to them. And, uh, you know, all through today, one of the common themes that we talked about today was touch points, right? So if you are wearing gloves on the clean side and you're touching this, that, everything, the scanner, the computer, uh, the instruments and all these things, you might be doing more damage then you actually realize, unless you're really cleaning and disinfecting those things between each set that you do. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of nuance to this discussion. And like you said, with the endoscopes, that's a whole other um, uh, can of worms. So um, I, I guess that's it's one thing that I'm going to throw back to Lisa is that why do manufacturers not know that this is a potential issue? If you have hand washing instructions, but nothing for disinfection, how are we as SPD ETEX uh, protecting ourselves in the clean side of SPD? Well, as far as manufacturers, I think the main reason is because they're not necessarily coming at this from the user perspective, right? So they're not, they're writing the instructions in from a lab, you know, in a very controlled setting, and they don't necessarily know all the nuances of what we go through in the day-to-day -day work world, right? Um, but I have some significant concerns about the um, decontamination area itself and technicians having the knowledge of how to appropriately set up one directional workflows to avoid purposely avoiding cross contamination risks. And it's especially considering those items that are passed through the window um, because 
as we've all said, they're not, they're not disinfected. So um, I think there's a huge opportunity for increased awareness and increased um, skill building in that area. Right. And I guess the probably the middle ground, if you want to try to find a middle ground in this area in sterile processing where, look, if it goes through the automated washer, it is technically fine to handle according to the guidelines uh, with your bare hands. Uh, maybe only use gloves on hand-washed items, and then if you do use them, make sure you remove the gloves after processing them or handling them. You know, do that proper hand hygiene, and then if you grab another one, put on fresh gloves and do it that way. But constantly removing and changing the gloves and doing the hand hygiene between, that might be your best bet in that specific case of, you know, there are specific things uh, that can't happen. Uh, Dr. Alpha, I'll give it back to you. Do you want to discuss uh, endoscope reprocessing, which is a whole whole other side of this debate? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it was interesting because I tried to look at some of the guidelines and see not just for the central reprocessing area, but for places like uh, endoscopy where the endoscopes are reprocessed. And once they come out of often an AER and they've had either high level disinfection or chemical sterilization. Um, the, I, I think in most centers there it's, it's common practice that they would actually don gloves to take it out of the AER and actually go and put it into whatever the storage area is in the, the clean component of it. But one area that often is overlooked is the idea of when you go then to get it out of the storage cabinet, are you wearing PPE when you do that? And I know that in a lot of centers, um, there there isn't a, a recognition that that component of it is also important. Um, and so the, the issues about um, wearing gloves when you're dealing with a re fully reprocessed endoscope. Um, I was really pleased to see in ST91, even the 2015 version, that they do talk about the safe handling and further decontamination, obviously, but that handling disinfected scopes, personnel should don PPE. And that means gown and gloves. And the idea being, and 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 you know, even myself when I've gone into these rooms, because that's not the environment that you know I spend my day in. Uh, I'm more in the research lab or the clinical microbiology component of things. And um, the idea of PPE is very important in all of those areas. And we tend to forget that when the scopes are in a storage cabinet and you're going to take it out to take it into a patient room, or you're going to check something. Um, the reality is if you go to touch that scope again, you really should have gloves on and you should have a gown in a, the appropriate PPE when you're going in to remove it. Because that process, uh, that the contact you have isn't just with the scope that you're taking out because you may accidentally touch or bump or uh, it, it interact with some of the other scopes that are in there. You've obviously opened the door and you may introduce contaminants that are on uh, you know, your uniform or on your hands. And so I think that's it, it's and it's really nice to see in ST91. It specifically states that if you go to take out a fully repressed scope, you should be wearing PPE for you know the, the regular PPE. And so I was really pleased to see that. And in fact, that they talk about the transport from the cabinet to the patient uh, care room that um, you really should have on you know fresh gloves and PPE. And the only study, because you know I'm a research fanatic, right? I always want to see what's been published in this area. And I could only find one study where they actually even talked about this issue. So ST91 states this, but the CSA documents on endoscope reprocessing or the section on endoscope reprocessing doesn't actually make a statement about fully reprocessed scopes and the use of a PPE. So I'm really happy that ST91 at least does that. The one research study that I found, they were actually looking at um, the storage life of scopes in storage cabinets, but mm. they commented on, and I'm, I'm going to read this because I think it is important. Um, and sorry, I should have said, this is a, a study that was done by Lacey et al. in um, 2019. Um, and it was published in the SGNA um, uh, journals. Once contaminants have been successfully eliminated from endoscopes through high-level disinfection or liquid chemical sterile processing, new contaminants must not be introduced. That's an important concept. In this study, all personnel accessing the endoscope cabinet donned gowns in addition to gloves, 
and gloves only had been the prior standard in this endoscopy unit. And they concluded that consistent use of PPE coupled with strict adherence to scope decontamination may be the best way to reduce contamination of endoscopes during storage. So I, I think that the whole endoscope issue, it is an important consideration and it's another one that's kind of under the radar. But um, my personal uh, recommendation would be that if you are going to um, take a scope out for whatever reason, especially if you take it out and then decide, oh, this is the one I want, you're going to put it back in there, that you definitely should be wearing PPE when you do that. And there's at least one study that suggests that, uh, you know, this is a good thing to do. And it really supports ST91 as well. Yeah, and I was really happy ST91 stated that as well, just because um, it is a hot button issue. There was a lot, I, I know people that were taking them with bare hands uh, out of the AER and yeah. saying, well, it's fine to touch now because it's already gone through the AER. But, um, you know, it, it's good to have these clarity on the on these types of issues because you really want to know what are the guidelines? What risk are we at if we don't do this? Um, all these things. So, you know, when we're talking about uh, gloves on the clean side, and especially when we're talking about something specific like the endoscopes, guidelines, studies, all these things are very helpful. So if anybody out there is a research scientist and wants to do a study on uh, the gloves on the clean side for things that do not go through a thermal disinfection cycle, I would be happy to participate in that because it is a fascinating subject and one that uh, a lot of SPD techs, I think, have this cognitive dis dissonance with that you know if things are not getting some type of disinfection how are how are you really protected uh from those items um so that brings us to good and hand Jim, hygiene oh sorry lisa go ahead adam i was just going to note that one of the participants has shared an article with us and i went ahead and um thanked them for it and asked them if they would share by chance any of their takeaways on that particular article but it had to do with contaminated gloves so yeah and contaminated gloves that was one thing we were talking about early on right with the uh when you're using gloves in the cleans i mean i've i've seen people and this is bad examples but i've seen people in decontamination that have gloves on that like fix their hair or push it by their ears yep. um you know kind of wipe their nose or move exactly. their mask to the side so they can <laughs> scratch an itch um, you know, there's a certain amount of that kind of stuff that when you're in decon, you're there for, you know, especially if you're eight hours in the decon area, you get yeah. that kind of, you know, I forget where I'm at a little bit and I just need to scratch something or just move something real quick. And there you're exposing yourself every time we do that. That's exposing yourself to a huge amount of risk. So contaminated gloves, definitely. And Lisa, yeah. Oh, um, as far as just to add on, just to tag on to what you just said um, in decon, Tam, when people are constantly pulling down their masks or adjusting their face shields, you know, they're constantly inoculating themselves, you know, with whatever is in the environment that they've, can, you know, encountered. So. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, I mean, it's, I know it's hard to do guys. I know it's hard. I've done it myself. I've been guilty of doing that once or twice too, but um, you've really got to try. If you, if you have to scratch that itch, go to take your gloves off, get clean gloves, wash your hands and then do it because Man, it's, it's a dirty place back there. Uh, so hand hygiene, we all know hand hygiene is pretty straightforward, right? You wash your hands, you get all the stuff off of them, and you are, you know, antiseptic uh, hand rubs and things like that. Uh, but when should SPD professionals, at least I'm going to give this question to you, when should SPD professionals be washing and or disinfecting their hands? Okay, so if we look at the CDC, they have five moments of hand hygiene. And these are more from a clinical perspective when we're um, when healthcare workers are working directly with patients. But if we were to take those and look at it specifically from a sterile processing perspective, let's do a quick comparison. So the first one is before touching a patient. So if we look at it as the instrument is the patient, then any time we would be touching an instrument, we would wash our hands before we do that. Um, the next one is before a clean or a septic procedure. Well, that's our entire world. <laughs> so we would ensure that we have appropriately performed hand hygiene before we do any process that's going to involve cleaning or anything involving a septic technique. So that is, you know, handling uh, items that come off the sterilizer or, you know, when we're transporting a sterile device to the OR for example. So, um, and as uh, Dr. Alpha was saying, um, endoscope, 
endoscope uh, transport. So um, the next one is after body fluid exposure or a risk. Okay, so there's two components to this. The first one is, of course, anything in decontam. The second component is anytime we're on the clean side, we are the next safety net. So we are inspecting to verify that nothing is going to be process that has any contamination on it. So we're that physical barrier, right? So we're visualizing through um, hopefully using our uh, visual inspection aids um, and uh, hopefully using um, technology such as um, ATP or, um, uh, you know, several other different types of testing techniques to verify the cleaning efficacy um, of instruments and uh, the functionality, of course. And then, um, so we would perform hand hygiene if we were to uncover that we've found something contaminated on the clean side. And then we would take appropriate measures from there to not just take that, not we won't be cleaning anything on the clean side. We would take the instrument that's contaminated and all of the instruments that it came with, the entire basket of instruments back to decontam, and then we would disinfect the entire workspace that had any contact with the devices and performing hand hygiene after that. So, um, so that's the third one. The fourth one is after touching a patient. So we wanted to do hand hygiene before touching the instrument. Now we're gonna perform hand hygiene after we've touched the instrument. That's important because whenever you're changing roles, you know, you're moving from one workstation to another workstation, there's a whole nother set of conditions that you're now responsible for. So um, that brings us to the fifth one, after touching patient surroundings. So you walk into your workspace and you are then going to thoroughly disinfect using the concept of the one directional workflow. Yep. Very good. And, you know, I think that, you know, that's another thing in SPD that we are trained to. There's certain times where you're supposed to do hand hygiene, right? When you go into the department or when you're leaving the department, when you're degowning from decontam, they tell you to wash your hands. Uh, but other than those things, like when you're coming back from break or all these other things, that's really the only time that we get the recommendation to do hand hygiene. So I love what you said that maybe we look at the CDC guidelines around this and figure out like maybe there should be more policies and procedures based around when you do hand hygiene in the sterile processing department, because just when you're coming in and out of the department probably is not enough uh, to protect you um, from all these things. And I did get a, uh, an answer to your question. You did ask about the takeaways on the gloves uh, from that article. And uh, they responded saying that that counting on counting on gloves in the box being clean does not work. So just because you see gloves in a box does not mean those gloves are not contaminated in some way as well. That's another point of touch point and contamination point as well. Uh, Dr. Alpha, where do you stand on the uh, hand hygiene inside the sterile processing department? <laughs> yeah, it is a, a how will I put it? It's quicksand because um, <laughs> I think there there's there's pros and cons to this, and I think the the review that Lisa gave I think is excellent in that um, you know uh, making an analogy to the five moments of uh, when hand hygiene should be done dealing with patients I think is is a good analogy. Um, I I do think that the. Uh, one of the things that has always bothered me, I guess, about some of the, the issues in terms of hand hygiene and decontam is the stream of devices coming through that have not had thermal decontamination and the idea that... I like the idea of the dirty to clean stream because you don't think of that in in the clean side because the the premise the underlying premise has always been that everything on that side is safe to handle because it's had thermal decontamination. So I like the idea of thinking of the moments of when you do hand hygiene, but also setting it up so that the workflow allows you to. Uh, um, get good workflow. So if, if there's devices coming through the window that um, have not had thermal decontamination, there, it's almost like there should be a, a separate stream for them and that the issues around um, hand hygiene should reflect the fact that those instruments 
are no different than on the other side of the window where they were handled in its entirety with gloves and that hand hygiene was an important part of that and all the steps of where hand hygiene should be done and that that so that stream being separate in a way from the other stream of instruments coming through that did get thermal decontamination because their hand hygiene is still an important consideration. And um, I, again, it is a bit of a sticky wicket issue because yes, they're safe to handle um, if they get thermal decontamination and no, they're not safe to handle if they haven't had thermal decontamination. So I see two streams going through on the clean side and that, that one stream is not clean and um, needs to be kind of handled that way. And hand hygiene should reflect that. In, in, in other words, that, that's very serious and, and important that gloves are worn and that hand hygiene is done appropriately when gloves are taken off. And on the quote unquote clean sign that have had thermal decontamination, um, you know, there still is a, a role, if you will, for wearing gloves. Um, and in terms of the hand hygiene component of it, if you're not wearing gloves, then absolutely uh, doing hand hygiene at the various moments that Lisa described, I think are important. I'd like to add one more thing. One, it's pretty common that technicians will keep gum or hard candy that's wrapped up like individually in their pockets and um, um, pop it in their mouth, you know, and think nothing of it wherever they are. Um, and part of that is because of the fact that we're not supposed to have even water in the restricted area. And, you know, after a long time of working, you get really thirsty and it's hard to break away always to get a drink. But um, it's extremely important to remind everybody that nothing should touch your mouth whatsoever in in the restricted area, nothing. Be outside of the department um, and uh, then hand hygiene should be performed again, so. Yeah, and you're right. I've seen gum in the department. I've seen Chex Mix. I've seen Doritos. I have seen all kind manner of Starbucks and drinks and water and soda. Uh, so I have seen all that in my years in SPD. Um, and they hide it. They, and especially when I was a manager, they hide it very well from me. But I know the little nooks and crannies. Especially any department I've worked in, I know the nooks and crannies. So I will find that stuff. Sometimes they hide it in a drawer. Um, but if you're doing that out there, please don't do that. And I know that a lot of SPD techs are probably out there thinking like, you know, if, if, if we were listening to Lisa's way of doing things, we're doing it basically before we touch every sterilizer load and all these other things. <laughs> I know that's a lot of hand hygiene, right? That's a lot of hand hygiene. But if you look at nursing and you look at other departments within the hospital, that's what they're doing. And that's they complain about that, too, that it's just between every little step they have to do a hand hygiene. But the reason is really important because there are so many hospital acquired infections and we know the number one driver behind those hospital acquired infections is hand hygiene. We're carrying it ourselves and bringing it to the patients. And if there's a way that we can kind of interrupt that chain of infection and sterile processing just by doing a little bit more hand washing, it really is worth it. Uh, I do want to make note there was another question that came in or not a question, more of a comment. Uh, that AORN recommends how hourly hand hygiene at minimum for sterile processing services. So that's another thing that if you're thinking about a department policy or procedure uh, surrounding sterile processing hand hygiene, that AORN recommendation is hourly. So another way to look at it. But um, I'm going to give this to Dr. Alpha because Dr. Alpha talked so much today about uh, the auditing of the process and giving staff that immediate feedback on the auditing. So should sterile processing departments, and this could be for other staff, uh, other departments as well, should we be auditing hand hygiene within our department on a regular basis? Well, my comment to that would be absolutely yes. And the reason for it is that hand hygiene um, is just as important in SPD or endoscope reprocessing as it is up in the ward. And it's important, um, I think, to uh, monitor because again, the, the phenomena, you don't know what you don't know, is that if you're not doing any monitoring, you really have no idea how frequently people are doing hand hygiene. And I think I think that the AORN recommendation that the listener brought forward is is actually um, you know an important one for people to be aware of, and that in terms of monitoring, I I think it's no different even even 
um, if you think about it, healthcare facilities often will do monitoring on people coming in, visitors, um, non-staff, and will even monitor them to identify whether or not they're actually doing some kind of, you know, usually there's an alcohol or water or alcohol-based uh, substance that can be used at the entrance to a healthcare facility. And there's often monitoring done to make sure that the people coming in are actually using that as well. So I, I do think there's a, um, a, good, a good basis for that. And and I think that uh, hand monitoring should be done. And I have one little comment I want to just put as an earworm in for the, the listeners um, regarding Lisa's last comment about, uh, or your last comment actually, about the idea of popping a candy or gum into your mouth. Think about it. The perception is that everything is safe to handle in the clean side. If you're dealing with those instruments or electronic devices that have not gone through thermal decontamination and you actually go and take a, a piece of, you've been handling that and then you go and take a gum and pop it in your mouth you've just exposed yourself to whatever organisms were on those devices that were not killed and definitely there is the potential for you to become colonized from doing that little habit of putting a candy or a piece of gum in your mouth after if you haven't been using gums in particular or even if you're wear sorry haven't been using gloves you're wearing just using your you're wearing your own hands <laughs> or whether you've got gloves on top of them the reality is that you could be introducing something to your own body and become colonized with it as well so put that as an earworm and think about it uh, really you shouldn't be eating or doing any of those things in the reprocessing area we all get tempted um we're all human but worry about the fact that you yourself might become colonized and that'll help i think right. um, guide us and then in terms of monitoring going back to the question that you asked i i believe that should be done not necessarily um it doesn't have to be an onerous uh, an, an onerous frequency but it should be done periodically to make sure that people are um, aware of and following the appropriate uh, hand hygiene guidelines in that facility i'd like to tag on to that real quick. Uh, two things. The first is um, you can be, just as a reminder, you can be um, exposed to something and not be sick and not get sick, you, but you can carry That's it right. to somebody else. So even if you don't have, you're completely asymptomatic, it's still, you don't know if you're going to potentially expose somebody else. The other thing is um, hand hygiene is not just about the process of cleaning our hands, right? It's also about the maintenance of the integrity of our skin. So we have to make sure that we're being mindful that if we have, you know, a scratch or, you know, anything like that, um, or if we have really dry hands, um, especially during the winter months, that we're doing things to maintain the integrity of our skin uh, so that we don't get exposed or potentially have um, opportunities for more uh, exposure um, to other things. And then uh, the last thing I want to say about this before we move on to the next topic is um, it's just an idea. Um, one of my the facilities that I worked at, we did, um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a Kamishi by board, but it's kind of a lean processing idea. And they had kind of a chart where um, there were several things that they wanted to audit for and and um, hand hygiene was one of them. And so um, we had a person and it was rotated amongst the staff and they would just be in charge for that shift of observing if um, hand hygiene was going well or not and of course that's a little bit subjective right but if they noticed something that was not compliant then they would make there was a card in there and they would flip it from red to green um green was good for the day and red was there was an incident so it just kind of helped to heighten awareness a little bit um that was just That's yeah, a great suggestion. <laughs> it is a great suggestion. I was just going to say that. Um, we did get a comment here. Uh, what about wearing your supposedly clean attire to this cafeteria? 
et cetera, when we're wearing those scrubs and we do go to lunch and we eat in those scrubs. And I don't think a lot of us think about the fact that we're carrying whatever was in the department with us and then bringing whatever we ate back with us back into the department. Um, yeah. And I know, like I said, with this cleaning, it opens cans of worms, right? If you if you think about this one thing, it could create this other problem that now you have to fix. But I mean, I think that the reason that these conversations are really helpful is because you know, we're, we're talking about resisting or, or stopping these hospital acquired infections and whatever we can do to do that can save patients lives. It's not like doing these things. Yes, it may be inconvenient for us, but it, the, the point is really that saving people is more important than the inconvenience of us having to do extra steps, like maybe changing our scrubs when we come back from lunch or maybe doing 100%. extra hand hygiene in the department. 100%. Yeah. And just to let you know, there was a, a VA hospital that I worked at for a while that they had a policy on that. And anybody who left the department had to wear one of those longer kind of Gore-Tex gown, uh, mm -hmm. OR gowns, and they would mm -hmm. wear that out of the department. And then they had a, a place to hang those up and they would go back into the department with just their scrubs on. So that, I don't know, that's how they handled it, but. Yep. That's another, that's another way to do it. I've seen people do the, um, uh, the bunny suits when they go to lunch. I've seen people do that. So um, there's, there's ways to get around it, but uh, I think it's all these questions are very good, very helpful. Um, we're going to jump to one that uh, Dr. Alpha, I'm going to give this to you first because it's uh, honestly, if Lisa and I take it, we're going to have SPD people emailing us uh, angry. <laughs> so I'm going to have them email you directly uh, with their, their anger and their rage filled questions. But um, when we're talking about the risk of transmission, the risk of the vector for uh, personal electronic devices in sterile processing, what kinds of risks do those cell phones pose if we bring them into the department? <laughs> well, you can you can predict what I'm going to say. Uh, I, I come from um, clinical microbiology background, and it's the same thing in the clinical microbiology lab. We're handling the the specimens and the organisms that cause disease, and it was an absolute no no that you you cannot bring your elect your personal electronic equipment into the laboratory. It stays in your locker, and at your breaks, um, that's when you can check it because you will be doing your hand hygiene coming and going, but absolutely uh, should not be present with you because we are all addicted to our phones and our bings and our dings and messaging coming in or the vibrations of it being there. Uh, you know, sometimes we are, um, our lives are dictated by that. I've turned off the notifications on many of the aspects of my cell phone because I found myself, as soon as it dings, I, I have to check it because it, who knows, it could be my kids or somebody important that, you know, is trying to get in touch with me. And I think when we're at work, we have to accept the fact that Honestly, you don't need that distraction. And um, functionally, uh, there certainly are departments, and I can tell you for sure the laboratories are one of them where uh, the personal electronic devices are not allowed to be brought into that space because it will be a distraction and you are potentially handling things that you will contaminate your device with and you're going to take that home to your family and to your kids and that just shouldn't, you, you shouldn't have that temptation that you've got it in your pocket and it dings and you feel, oh, I have to answer it because, you know, um, maybe my kids are at school and I and blah, blah, blah. And we explain to them that if there is an issue with children at school or in daycare or whatever, now, make sure that they have the main office uh, phone number so that they can get in touch. And that way you, you don't feel obligated to take your cell phone or your electronic communication device with you. And so I, I'm I'm somewhat biased because I come from that background. And, um, you know, I think it's important to recognize it's not just what you you know, get colonized with or expose yourself to. It's the fact that that device goes with you home. And you don't want to be exposing your family and loved ones to things on your device that you're not even aware of, because we transition to that whole issue about how do you clean and decontaminate electronic devices too? Um, you know, I mean, and let's let's not even face that issue with our personal electronic devices. They should be in your locker, and you check it breaks, uh, but you don't take it into your work environment. Uh, and sorry, I'm I'm totally biased on that one. <laughs> Yeah. No, and if the angry emails, you can, uh, Dr. Alpha's email is in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. 
So direct those uh, those angry I'm remarks to her, please. I'm going to pull these ones and send them to you. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Send yeah. them on to me. That's fine. Yeah. I'm used to the angry <laughs> SPD. So uh, Lisa, where do you stand on uh, devices in the department? So I don't disagree at all. I would love the newer technologies that are coming out there may have some solutions for us. Um, perhaps UV light, uh, such as we had a, that talked about, um, you know, those different technologies, they might be utilized in this capacity to even disinfect our badges. Because how many times do we clean our badges? You know what I mean? So like there, there's a lot of things. It's not just our cell phones. And the other thing is, is that more and more of our work is getting interfaced with technology. And, you know, there's mobile apps that go along with some of the uh, data analytics tools and um, reporting and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, you think about um, some of the uh, tracking systems and the, the companies that help with like vendor tray management and stuff like that. You know, they have maybe a, a tablet that goes along with their technology. And sometimes we want to take a picture of a, you know, for compliance purposes. And so, um, you know, that is definitely something that is important to think about when we're having this conversation, but making sure that it's done safely. Because right now there's really no uh, standardization. There's no um, even adequate monitoring going on at all. And right. the cell phones are probably one of the most contaminated things that we could ever bring into our department. Absolutely. And that's uh, anybody that's on the fence about this issue and thinks, well, I need to have my cell phone. This is an emergency thing. If I, somebody needs to get a hold of me, this is how they get a hold of me. Um, I completely understand that, um, you know, that point of view. Um, but you have to think also, it, it, look at it under a microscope, literally. Take it to uh, the lab, get them to culture your phone, and then look at what grows inside that culture because I guarantee you it will terrify you. Um, if we ATP tested an entire department, we basically looked at every touch point and every surface in our department, the number one most contaminated, and it wasn't even close, the decontam sink was a close second with dirty instruments in it. It was second <laughs> to the cell phones. The cell phones actually had more ATP on them um, than the dirty decontam sink. So think about that when you're talking about bringing that cell phone into the department. Um, and uh, you know, and I, you know, there's other things that go along with the cell phone debate, right? It's it's the whole can of worms thing because I know there's a lot of millennials out there who, again, need that uh, phone nearby. They have to be on it all the time. It's a great source of information. Uh, you know, we work for Beyond Clean, Lisa, and that's a, a podcast is an incredible way to make your day go quicker. And how better to access the Beyond Clean podcast than by going on your phone and listening to it that way? So there's a lot of this, and I know millennials are saying, "Well, I I do it all touch free. It's all on my watch." So I I don't actually touch the phone ever. It just stays in my pocket and everything I do on my watch. Well, the watch is the same thing, right? It's just a vector. It's another surface, a fomite that can breed microorganisms. So the watch isn't necessarily better. I think unless, and, and regardless of all these devices and all these things we talk about, there has to be some type of system to clean and decontaminate or disinfect them. Um, and it's going to go to um, somebody uh, made a comment here about the uh, Vocera phones or the Volt phones that you see in your departments. Um, you just you clean and sanitize it before each use. You wipe it down um, and then you put it in its charger. The next person comes in, grabs that phone for the department and takes it in. And you have some type of process with that to actually clean and disinfect those. Um, and then Lindsay, our colleague at Beyond Clean, also had this to say. So I want to get Lisa's take on this uh, with the tracking systems that people are likely working toward mobile options. I know a lot of tracking systems would like you to be able to scan items from your phone and to scan them to devices. Um, is there a safe way that we could possibly use those phones for tracking devices uh, when they may be an important part of the SPD tracking process? Yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about earlier. And I think that the technologies that are coming, such as, you know, the UV light, uh, there's there are even 
UV light boxes that you can get that even go like that would fit into a pass window that may in in fact be a great idea for the items that are hand washed on the dirty side and pass through the window. You know, there's it it's it's up for discussion. I don't think that we know exactly what the answers are quite yet, but there's enough technologies out there that we really should be doing more studies. We really should be um, embracing what's there so that we can invite the innovation that's to come. Yeah. And uh, the first speaker today, uh, Dr. Alistair Keen, and if you if you missed that session, it was really uh, fascinating about, uh, you know, micro antimicrobacterial surfaces um, and things that they're doing with these surfaces that are antimicrobial. Um, there may be something that they can do with cell phones at some point, right? The tracking devices themselves, where if those surfaces are antimicrobial, yes, if you're taking them home, that, that risk is still there. But maybe if you can have it in the department um, and just use it uh, when it's there. Um, and I, the other thing I'll say for millennials, too, that always I need my cell phone for uh, emergencies. I grew up and I, I am aging myself, yes, uh, before <laughs> the age of cell phones. Um, so if I had a family emergency, somebody needed to call me, they had to have my work number. Um, in the case of emergency, you just have that work number and that's the one you call if I'm at work and I can't answer my cell phone. Um, so, you know, I, I sit the fence a little bit. I'm pro cell phones because yes, they can be useful. I think, you know, the tracking devices and things like that, um, uh, that is coming, I think is going to be very good. And I think it can be a good tool to use hands-free as much as possible. And then always, always, always disinfect. Um, but I do respect Dr. Alpha's opinion too, that, you know, if you have cell phones, they should stay in the pocket. So that's, again, this is a hot button issue and I don't think there's any definitive answer on pros or cons. It's just, I mean, it is all pros and cons, right? There's, there's pros and cons to these things. So, um, you know, we don't have Can a lot of time left. Oh, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. I just want to make the comment that I, I do think that the UV irradiation component, it's even being used up on the wards for things like uh, IV stands and commodes, et cetera. So I do think the concept that if there is a work-related one, not a personal item, but a work-related uh, pad or uh, phone that's being used for documentation or tracking, that those ones, um, um, wiping them down and then actually putting them through something like a UV exposure, um, I think is a good idea. And I think that's a great way to deal with the things that are related to tracking and work that uh, that Lisa was talking about. So I'm I'm not against that, but I still believe that personal um, phones, um, I, I just worry about what people take home and I really think they should not be in the workplace when you're working. No, absolutely. It's an excellent point. Um, we did have some comments and I'll go ahead and get to those before we move to the next question, but uh, the VA SPS hospitals are getting uh, UV pass-through windows installed. Um, in some of their VA. So that's that's excellent news. UV pass through windows would be a, a good um, interim solution when we don't have that thermal disinfection option available uh, for those low temperature items that UV disinfection could be a good alternative. Um, so let's see, uh, when and how should department accessories, so tape dispensers, staplers, all these things that are the ancillary items that are in the department, how often should those be cleaned and disinfected? I'm sure there's people out there thinking, I don't know that mine have ever been disinfected. Um, but uh, are these devices even manufactured to be cleaned and disinfected? Dr. Alpha, I'll send this one to you. Uh, department <laughs> accessories like staplers and tape dispensers, uh, how often should yeah. they be cleaned? <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a sad, uh, how, I'll call it a sad question to ask because there's no real good answer to it. And we kind of found this out when we were doing a ward study where we actually monitored the keyboards that were being used. And some of them did have keyboard protective covers, others didn't. And of all the ATP monitoring that we did, the highest levels we got were on those keyboards. And a lot of it is because they rarely get uh, cleaned and disinfected. And 
there's fear of electronics damaging them, number one. And number two, the, a lot of them were not manufactured to withstand cleaning and disinfection uh, as we know it. So um, in terms of things like tape dispensers, staplers, et cetera, I, I really don't think that they, the ones that we're currently using anyway have been manufactured or have guidelines for how to clean and disinfect them. Um, I do think it should, though, be part of the wipe down during the daily cleaning and disinfection that's being done. And I guess the issue would be that, you know, if you did include those uh, as part of your daily kind of, you know, cleaning that's actually done, uh, what impact would it have? Because I know when we first started looking at some of the keyboard stuff, uh, we, destroy we destroyed a few keyboards because they really weren't meant to withstand kind of any liquid of any way, shape or form um, getting onto them. Um, so I, I think it's a catch-22 where... Again, I think it's a good idea that if you do have those things around, um, it's not a bad idea to give them a wipe down when you're doing, you know, your daily wipe down in terms of your counters and stuff like that when they're being done, whether it's being done by you personally or it's being done by the EBS services. But the problem is that I doubt very much that they have been manufactured or would give you recommendations for what products to actually use on those types of devices. So I say that with caution, and um, uh, but just as a general practice, I'd rather have it wiped down, disinfected, wiped or cleaned and disinfected uh, before I go to use it again um, on the clean side in particular. Because if you're not wearing gloves, and even if you are wearing gloves, you don't really want to um, have that as a as, as a reservoir in the environment that's quote unquote the clean side. Just those yeah. are my thoughts, and I don't have any research to back that. I do know for sure that if you think about it, there has, there is data on the stethoscopes that are done for doctors, and they often are contaminated, and they rarely get cleaned or disinfected, and that that is changing because those are used on each you know patient to patient. So it's important to do that. But the this this group of things, tapes and um, staplers, I, I think is a unique little subset of things that you know, we don't often think about. Right. And I mean, uh, tape dispenser, I think, is an interesting thing to look at because there's adhesive involved. There's probably particles of adhesive that are flying around that area as you're pulling the tape and as you're p breaking the tape. Um, so we know adhesive is one of those things that bio burden, um, you know, microorganisms love to hide Cleanse inside you. tape, inside adhesive, inside those things. So the tape dispenser, I'd be very uh, interested in. And any of these things, if anybody really thinks like, hey, I think you guys are blowing this out of proportion, I'm not going to wipe down my stapler every time we use it. I'm not going to be wiping down my tape dispenser every time we use it. Uh, I would challenge you to ATP test it or do some type of culture testing. Um, uh, Dr. Alpha, I know you. Uh, we talked earlier about um, different ways of monitoring those kinds of tests and things like that. Um, you know, it's... I would challenge you to really look at that and show the proof to do the testing and look at the proof and see what's growing on those things. Because my guess is it's probably uh, not ideal. Uh, Lisa, did you have uh, more to add on staplers yeah. and tape dispensers? So there's a lot of departments that have an issue with dust accumulation. And, you know, in one of the ones I worked at, we had um, so much that we had these air, air hoses at every single workstation and at the ceiling where they attached, um, there was so much accumulation of dust that they were started, the bunnies started to fall down, you know, and land onto the workstations, you know, and you think about the structure of the, of the work table itself, you know, whenever you have, um, you know, you're going to get ready for your joint commission survey. You start doing some really deep cleaning, which you should be doing all the time. Um, you find layers of really thick accumulation of dust in underneath, you know, the uh, work table and, you know, on the sterilizer carts on the underneath parts and, um, you know, the back ends of inside of uh, little bins and so on the workstation itself where it has the most uh, exposure to the set right before it's packaged to put into the sterilizer you know you don't want to have anything that's going to attract dust um, and oftentimes there's a computer sitting on the workstation and so we know that electronics attract dust and so um the fact that uh, Dr. Alpha mentioned the keyboard, um, 
bring brought me to kind of think about those um, the fact that most uh, departments I've worked in or been in they don't have the little covers to go over the keyboards and it seems like that especially in Deacon Tam would be you know I don't know why we wouldn't have that in there. Um, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's actually a antimicrobial decontamination <laughs> cover. I think that's what it's for. Um, yeah. But I don't know why there's decontams where it's, yeah, that keyboard just sits open to whatever is yeah. on people's gloves as they're typing. I don't know how many scanners we've lost due to, you know, it getting wet. So, but anyway, that's, that's a, another topic. But um, I was just suggesting that I think that some of those basic things of, you know, your basic uh, human factors, um, aspects of, you know, the stapler, the tape dispenser, the computer, the bins that hold the little indicators and that kind of stuff. All of those things um, co are collection places for accumulation of part particulate uh, contamination. Right. And, so, yeah, we should be routinely, routinely meaning, I think, whenever you're taking ownership of a workspace, that's your job to wipe it down before you get started. Completely wipe it down. Yep. And I know that takes time. I know that there's time involved in all these things. But, yeah, I would look around the department, see where your risks are, right? That's what risk assessments are all about. You know, where is the potential that something could be hiding that we haven't looked at, haven't wiped down, haven't cleaned? Um, you know, there's, there's, as you said, there's just places in the department that just gather dust. And, the, you know, dust is another one microorganisms love to live in, right? It's a protective layer almost for them. So um, we're at... It's, we're at an hour, so I'm going to ask you guys one quick question um, uh, real quick. And uh, Dr. Alpha, I'll throw it to you first. Are, do you feel like there's considerations around hand hygiene and the handling of sterile goods? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I am not uh, somebody who's worked in SPD, so I'm going to couch my statements by that, that uh, comment. I, I personally as an outsider looking in, in terms of infection prevention and, and control, I think the, the biggest risk is actually when the packages are coming out of, for instance, steam sterilization, and there's a risk of wet wet uh, wet loads. And I think that, um, and a, number one, an appreciation of a wet load and what you do with it. But number two, that the handling that you do, and if you don't uh, reprocess that wet load, keep in mind that, that whatever handling you're using, if you touch it with bare hands, uh, the microbes on your finger will wick through into that package so I think the you know that that I think is a very serious consideration in terms of how they should be handled um, uh, from the perspective of um, if you're wearing gloves when you're handling them great you're going to reduce the load that your microbes are going to go through but at the same time um, I think in terms of hand hygiene um, the issues around that if you're handling sterile goods and you're moving packages and putting them on, you know, the whole tenant of storage of sterile packaging is uh, not to have more events than are absolutely necessary for handling of that package until it's actually picked and taken to the OR or to wherever it's going to be used. And so I think that the hand hygiene around that, um, I think there needs to be consideration given to what it is that you're handling. Is it in a state that um, is appropriate and safe to handle? And then following kind of the, the national guidelines on that and that when you're finished doing your job and moving on to doing something else, you know, that's kind of one of those moments where that would be an appropriate moment to do hand hygiene as well. Um, so, I, you know, I'll give you, I, those are my thoughts on it because, you know, as uh, somebody who looks at kind of, medical device reprocessing, I think one of the biggest risks is when you have a wet load and you don't actually, or people don't actually respond and, and put it back through the reprocessing. Um, and, and remembering that anytime you touch those packages or any surface it's put on, if it's not a sterile surface, it's a, you know, a transport uh, a trolley, anything that is on those can wick into the package. And that there have been evidence and data published to show that in some instances uh, there are organisms that do get into those packages from that wicking process. So to me that would be a high risk event and from a regular standing perspective I think it's really the the guidelines around good hand hygiene and the moments at which you do it. 
And Lisa, what say you on uh, hand hygiene? I think you mentioned it earlier with your CDC regulations, right? Uh, hand yes. hygiene for handling sterile items. Absolutely. Um, and so one of the things that I did a, about a year ago, I wrote an article on LinkedIn uh, regarding uh, performing a sterile instrument tray audit. And one of the criteria happened to be um, inspecting the trays for um, your, your sterile package for integrity before you actually take it to the OR. So, and I had several criteria that um, went along with that process. But um, one of the things that you want to do is make sure that you have thoroughly wash your hands and that they're dry before you touch any sterile package and that you handle the transport of that device in such a way that um, it's because because it's going to be aseptically opened. The obviously the outside is um, is unsterile and has contaminants on it, but you are um, verifying that in the transport process, um, there is no indicator to you that there's a compromise in the packaging. And one of those, uh, w one of the things to consider is your, your hands, where they have been, and if you are going to be um, potentially exposing that tray to anything before it goes into the into that room so yeah absolutely and uh, all great points thank you guys so much we are out of time so i'm going to go ahead and uh, close this session for right now but thank you lisa thank you dr alpha uh for joining me this uh, discussion was a lot of fun um and uh, we had a lot of participation so i think other people enjoyed it as well um if you guys have any questions that we weren't able to get to you can connect with lisa dr alpha and myself uh, via email or linkedin and as our day comes to a close i would like to once again thank our today's uh event sponsor uh 3m uh, without their support, this exciting day of virtual learning would not have been possible. I would also like to extend a special thank you to our industry experts for joining us for this virtual event. And I'd like to recognize all of the professionals who reprocess surgical instruments across the globe. For all of you who chose to spend the day with uh, educating yourself, uh, we'd like to thank you for your dedication to professional development and best practice. At this session's close, you will be directed directly to the conference survey page where you will have access to the survey. And from there, you can download your CE certificate. If you wanna come back to the survey later, you can visit Beyond Clean uh, Credit Hub at any time at beyondclean.net slash virtual events. Uh, all of today's sessions will be available on demand. So please feel free to rewatch, share, continue to access the downloadable resources provided to you. And thank you guys so much. You guys were great in the Q&A all day. Everybody had great questions, great comments. Uh, so stay safe out there, sterile processing. And as always, keep fighting dirty. And we'll see you next time. Bye.